Uh, uh, today I will so not talking about optics, but more actually scanning internally microscopy. But uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, I want to show you like a collaborative work with uh, Professor Mike Cromie at uh, 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 Berkeley, trying to explore this different solid uh, uh, behavior of electrons using two-dimensional transition metal dichrochogenite. Also, oh, two-dimensional electron gas is arguably the most studied system in physics, but also in engineering, <laughs> uh, because uh, oh, this is a field effect transistor, like uh, which we have billions in our computers, uh, which really uh, operate by or using a gate to control a two-dimensional electron gas. So if you use a gate voltage, you can attract a lot of electrons. And when you have large enough electron density, basically they become metallic and it becomes highly conducting. And that's how you turn it on. Uh, so it is well understood then basically when you have a, a high density uh, 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 to the electron gas, you basically form a, a metallic uh, Landau Fermi liquid. Uh, however, it was also known a, a long time ago that uh, if the electron density is very low, uh, they will actually not be in the liquid phase, but instead they will actually form a two-dimensional electron solid known as Wigner crystal. Uh, or the way to understand uh, Wigner crystal, actually I learned from Andy when I was a graduate student at Columbia. So it's really controlled by the parameter Rs, which defines the competition between kinetic energy of electron and potential energy of electron. So when the kinetic energy is high, or when, which means that when Rs is small, then the electrons just want to lower its kinetic energy by being uh, very delocalized. On the other hand, when uh, the potential energy is very large, or it basically wants to minimize the potential energy and then basically to stay apart from each other and they form this uh, Wigner crystal phase. Uh, quantitatively, the uh, or potential energy scales with E squared over A modified by dielectric constant. And then uh, A is basically characteristic uh, 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 distance between electrons. And the kinetic energy scales with um, or P squared over 2M. So it scales with one over A squared. So it's easy to show that Rs uh, has this expression. So it basically uh, is proportional to effective mass of electron. So if you want to have strong correlation on large Rs, it's good to have large electron density. And furthermore, it scales with the distance between electron, which is uh, square root of n. Uh, so, so basically when you want to have strong correlation, you want, uh, or when to want to push to the Wigner crystal phase, you want large effective mass and uh, a large electron separation or low density. And to them, uh, okay, although this general idea is very well understood. So at high density, you have a liquid, at low density, you have a solid, but there are actually uh, still a lot of uh, outstanding questions regarding the uh, uh, electron uh, solid or like the Wigner crystal, or why it's like, how does the melting happen when you go from the Fermi liquid case to uh, the, the Wigner crystal solid? And the other thing is, so oh, for experimentalists, uh, unavoidably, they are disorders in real materials. So how does disorder affect this kind of a liquid solid transition and, and the general behavior of the uh, uh, Wigner crystal electron solid? Uh, and furthermore, uh, in addition to have random disorders with two dimensional material, we can actually uh, controllably create potential fluctuations. So now with this kind of uh, or well-defined potential confinement, how would this electron solid behavior change? So these are all questions that uh, one can explore by using two-dimensional uh, Van der Waals materials because oh, uh, now we can exfoliate individual layer of uh, 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 2D semiconductors and we can stack them in many different ways so the result, uh, a simplest case is if you have a, a simple semiconductor 2D layer, basically you have, uh, you can create a plane to the electron gas and naturally you'll find there are quite a few disorders <laughs> around. So you can study the disorder effect on the uh, Wigner crystal. Uh, but furthermore, by combining heterostructures, sometimes you can create one dimensional periodical potential 
uh, this is an example of these uh, uh, 1D domain walls, and you can even form an array of them. Uh, uh, and also, it's very well known by uh, uh, having twisted samples, you can form a two-dimensional periodical potential. So one can ask, well, when you have this 1D periodical potential and 2D periodical potential, how would this electron solid behavior change or, or look like? So today I will tell you our effort trying to kind of uh, explore in those directions. So first I will uh, uh, consider the situation of 2D Mori super lattice. And you, when you add many electrons in the system, how uh, weakened molecule type of states can uh, emerge, uh, which they form a periodic array themselves. And then I will tell you uh, what happens uh, uh, when you have this 1D domain walls, uh, either in individual 1D domain wall where you can see lighting your liquid behavior or arrays of uh, domain walls where you can actually see coupling between adjacent uh, uh, 1D chains. And last, I will show you what happens when you have just plain 2D material, but with disorder, how the uh, weakness solid and this kind of uh, uh, solid liquid transition look like. Okay, so we start with the first case where you have a Mori super lattices. Uh, oh, many of you might have seen these pictures, like when you have 2D uh, material, either they have a small lattice mismatch, or if you add a twist angle, then the two layer lattice constant has a small difference and that uh, oh, uh, create a long range periodical potential uh, that the electron can see. And when you dope electron in this Mori super lattice, uh, you can realize uh, um, a Hubbard model where you can get all kinds of correlated insulator and topological uh, uh, states uh, and even uh, superconductivity when you have doped multi insulators. Uh, but most of those studies focus on the situation where you have uh, one electron or like a fraction of electron per uh, uh, more unit cell. What we would like to explore uh, mostly here is actually when you have a Mori potential that's very deep. And when you can put many electrons in a single Mori unit cell, what will happen? So imagine that uh, all the Mori potential is very deep uh, in a single unit cell. You can approximate it is a basically a deep harmonic uh, oscillator. And for individual unit cell, you can think it's like an artificial atom where you add electrons uh, in, into it. Uh, so when you have multiple electrons in a kind of a quantum dot or like an artificial atom, uh, they are actually, the, again, two competition between kinetic energy and potential energy. So kinetic energy, you can think basically is these uh, uh, quantized levels of individual uh, 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 electrons. And then the uh, potential energy is a Coulomb uh, potential. And depend on the competition, uh, the feeding of electron can happen into uh, different ways. Uh, one is if this uh, quantization energy is larger than basically the Coulomb interaction, or then we'll just feel things like a uh, 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 one by one. So you you basically the lowest uh, state you have feel two electrons, and then another two electrons feel at the this uh, higher state, and so on and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, when the Coulomb interaction is very large then it will just neglect all these quantized uh, levels. So again, electrons won't just be far apart uh, from each other. So then basically they can just be pushed away from the center. So although the center has the lowest potential, but when the Coulomb potential dominate, that can actually correspond to lowest electron density. So in Mori uh, super lattice, it turns out that this kind of a competition between or Coulomb energy U and this quantized energy uh, delta can be tuned in different systems uh, and uh, tuned by a uh, uh, Mori period. So one can actually indeed uh, push them into different limit. So in order to see this electron uh, lattice, we will mostly use scanning tunneling microscopy because it has very high spatial resolution. And in order to uh, create this uh, model system where we want a very deep potential so that it can hold many, many uh, electrons or holes, we will uh, mostly use this near 60 degree twisted uh, uh, bilayer WS2. Uh, so basically our theoretical collaborator, Professor Steve Lewis group uh, tells us this system 
has uh, a particularly strong uh, Mori potential, uh, partly due to uh, two reasons. One is in general, homo bilayer tends, tends to give you stronger hybridization compared with hetero bilayer. So you want to basically ha or have two TMD layer of the same type. And also for uh, uh, WS2, it turns out, uh, or especially for the whole band, uh, when the two layer hybridize, it turns a gamma point actually becomes the lowest energy state for the valence band rather than K point. And it has been shown that the gamma point tend, tends to have much stronger hybridization and that helps to give a very strong uh, um, kind of a, a potential confinement. And the or 60 degree twist angle also helps. I mean, it turns out the lattice reconstruction create a strain pattern that further helps. So all these things added together give a very deep potential well for this system. Okay, so once we have electron in it, and if we want to image this uh, kind of electron solid state, uh, there is actually a subtlety about doing scanning tunnel microscopy that we need to uh, pay attention of. So if we, uh, or because <clears throat> if you want to image, say the Wigner crystal electron solid, you want to make sure that the tip that's, I mean, is probing the electron density, but doesn't perturb the system too much. Uh, but if you do a conventional scanning tunnel microscopy, what the people <laughs> usually, uh, or which is well developed in studying met metallic state, is usually you will use a very small tip bias between the, the tip and the, the, the uh, sample, and then you probe low energy physics and basically the uh, DITV curve tells you the effective density of state. However, the, this kind of picture or this uh, probe doesn't work very well for uh, semiconductors or to the semiconductors. <clears throat> and the reason is because if you have a doped semiconductor, say here is the end of semiconductor, the work function of the semiconductor and the work function of the metal tends to be very different by hundreds of milliev or sometimes one electron volt. So that's why if you have a metal and a semiconductor, they usually form a well-known short key barrier. So, so in this case, if you have a small uh, tip bias, then what happens is basically, or since the, uh, if you apply small bias, then the work function has to align, uh, then, because they have very different, uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the first work function, uh, uh, I mean, the electrochemical potential ha has to align. And then because they have very different uh, 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 work function, then the basically vacuum level will be very strongly offset. So that means basically there will be a very strong band bending and there will be a very large electrical field between the STM tip and the, uh, the sample, which creates the band bending uh, in or semiconductor physics, like the, the short key uh, barriers. And uh, this means this, this very large electric field below your tip basically will push the electrons around and strongly perturb the system. So you will not be able to get a simple like a density of state mapping, or you will not be able to map out electron density because everything is kind of a perturbed or destroyed by the tip itself. So in order to overcome this difficulty, what we can do is actually purposely apply a relatively large bias voltage between the, uh, the sample and the tip. So the idea is we will use the bias voltage to compensate the work function difference. So in this case, the, <clears throat> oh, the, the electrochemical potential uh, between the, or the Fermi energy between the uh, semiconductor and then the uh, tip is very different. There is a very large uh, Fermi energy difference controlled by the bias voltage. Uh, but then when you apply, I mean, when, when this difference basically uh, compensate the work function difference, you can see the vacuum level actually aligns. That means the, or there's no net electrical potential uh, between the tip and the sample. You don't have residue uh, building electric field. So in this case, the tip will provide minimum perturbation to your uh, electron uh, system, but at the same time, because the Fermi energy is very different, then the doped electron in the uh, conduction band of uh, uh, the semiconductor 
will still be able to tunnel into the tip and give you a finite tunneling current. So in this case, we call it, uh, and basically this tunneling current only comes from conduction band edge state. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, so, so in this case, basically, if you measure not the IPV, but the, on, the, the net tunneling current, the tunneling current will actually tell you what's the local electron density uh, in the conduction band that can tunnel into the tip. Uh, or similar uh, scheme can be used for whole dope sample. Uh, again, you basically apply a bias voltage that you compensate the work function difference and then the holes can tunnel into the tip. So in this case, by measuring the kind of uh, uh, tunneling current itself, you would be able to know what's the local electron or hole density. So here, just showing some experimental result related to this uh, tunneling uh, behavior. So uh, the left part uh, shows basically, uh, this is actually a DIPV curve as a function, or maybe a tunneling current, uh, as a function of uh, the bias voltage between the tip and the sample, as well as the vertical axis is the gate voltage. So what we can see is uh, when we put the tip is a little bit far away from the sample and then just va uh, vary the uh, uh, bias voltage, we can see basically a tunneling current uh, in this side on that side and th there's a relatively large gap in the middle. So this is a very similar to a conventional situation. You can tunnel into the conduction band and balance band, but when the tip chemical potential is inside the gap, you see very little uh, tunneling current. But what, when we actually push the tip very close to the sample, we actually found that or if we zoom in the uh, kind of a, a, a close to the gap region, we actually found that there is a finite tunneling current e even inside the gap, which is corresponds to this situation. So even when the tip uh, kind of a, a Fermi energy is inside the gap, as long as you have doped sample, there is actually a finite tunneling current. And then that tunneling current will be able to tell us what's the local electron uh, density distribution. So with this method, we can start to kind of uh, or look at <coughs> the electron or hole distribution uh, in, the case, uh, in the system. So we'll first look at the hole doped case where you have uh, or basically apply a negative gate voltage on the bilayer WS2 and then you start to dope hole uh, in the system. So this is where, yes. Can we just go back a slide? Yes. And help, help me on two points. So, so the first is that, yeah, as you say, the usual discussion is that the WSC2 is hole doped. So we put electrons in, uh, we take out electrons from the top of the valence band of WSC2, right? And that's where the discussion of bigger crystals and TMBCs and so on come from. Are you really interested in the case where the WS2 is electron doped and it's those electrons that are forming the Wigner crystal? Uh, in principle, we can study both sides. Right, but which, which one are we talking about here? I'm, I'm just confused because- um, Oh, we'll do both. But a lot of your discussion here has to do with using as your probe electrons in the conduction band. And I thought that in many cases like your one hole dope, you don't have any electrons in the conduction okay. band. So yeah, so there are two pictures here. So in this case, we'll uh, probe the electron in conduction band. And then we can also gate it to hole dope. Then we can also probe hole in the valence band. So we can do both. And I will show you result for both electrons and holes. And then my other question is just for theoretical background. Um, uh, what's what does the theory collaborators tell you about the size and shape and depth of the potential wells that we're talking about here? Um, so, okay. So for uh, hetero bilayers, like uh, oh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the WS2, uh, I think they can be like uh, like three or 400 millieV deep. Like, uh, and? Uh, oh, the width is basically determined by the Mori. I understand, yeah. but, but in practice for things like this, how? how... Is around eight, the 10 nanometer is the one that we will be mostly looking at, okay. around 10 nanometer, yeah. And how many, so that means that if I just take, just taking into account the Coulomb energy of a couple of electrons in that, it sounds like this is in a case where U is less than the depth of the well. 
if I do E squared over epsilon. Yeah, yeah, U is definitely less than the depth of, of the well, but it's uh, larger or comparable. I mean, it's definitely, it's actually larger than the, the you know, level spacing harmonic, inside. Uh, the level level. Spacing. That's right, yes, yes. So, I mean, yeah, U is definitely smaller than depth of the well. That's why you can put multiple carriers in, in, in one well. Right? Okay, thanks, sorry. Oh, yes. So maybe one question on, so the sample you are considering here is uh, gamma valley or k valley? So when you hold up, uh, you're injecting goals in the gamma valley or the gamma? Yeah, so since I'm talking about a few different systems, so they, they will vary. Like uh, for the holes, uh, uh, is actually all in, in gamma valley. For the electrons, uh, there's some uncertainty, but we now we think it's most likely to be in the K-value for the electrons. <clears throat> okay, so, so this is the holes, and then this potential is very deep and it's in the uh, gamma value. So when we put one hole per Maurice super lattice, so, right, uh, so basically you, you actually see these holes are indeed localized nicely in this periodical Mori super lattice. But when you start to add uh, two holes per uh, Mori super lattice, or you can see in the non-interacting picture, or two particles can sit in the same uh, electronic state. But we can already see the charge distribution is quite a bit different. There is it, certainly spread out and there is also kind of a dip in the middle. Uh, when we have three holes uh, per Mori super lattice, you can see very dramatic change where now they really avoid the center position and they form actually a triangle for three holes. Uh, when you have uh, four holes, they have a oh, kind of a triangle, but then some kind of blurring thing in the middle. Uh, we can qualitatively understood this behavior, just still think about individual Mori super lattice first, just think it as a quantum dot. <clears throat> when you have a uh, two hole per uh, uh, super lattice, uh, because of the triangle lattice, the potential is kind of somewhat triangle shaped. And then uh, there are basically three equivalent configuration in the classical picture when you want to just local, I mean, minimize the classical uh, 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 potential energy. But then quantum mechanically, all these states were hybridized. So the uh, theory actually predicts that you, you will form really like a donut shape. Uh, but in the real system, what happens is there's also a small residue strain. So we don't see a perfect donut shape. It's like a little bit elongated in that direction, but you can clearly see a dip in the middle. Um, so when you have a three hole lattice side, then this classical configuration really dominate. There's only a single classical configuration to minimize the uh, 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 potential energy, and that's basically the situation will look like. Uh, <clears throat> when you have uh, four holes, so what happens? Oh, hand waving, you can think three holes want to be very far apart from each other, but then the last one uh, doesn't have any two way to go, so it ba basically becomes more delocalized. So we can also uh, look at uh, what happens on the electron side. Uh, for the electron side, uh, uh, we think the electron is likely to be at the k-doping, so the potential well will will be uh, not as strong. Um, uh, we basically find that uh, oh, one electron is like this, and two electrons spread out a little bit, and three electrons also show a triangle-like thing, but it's not as obvious as the whole side. So the difference is basically the effective mass as well as the kind of uh, Mori potential are slightly different between the electron and the whole side. Yes? Yeah, maybe uh, what, what about incommensurate feeling factors? The, like instead of having commensurate feeling factors of the Mori itself, what happened when you? Oh, you be, oh, so it's a part of partial field ra yeah, rather than. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. So uh, when the uh, it's a partially field case, for example, if you have uh, one electron and uh, two electron, then you will see. So it's kind of a some position will be like filled with one electron, and some position will look like two electron, and they form like a 
something like those uh, generalized Wigner crystal configuration where the like a two whole polarity sites will avoid the nearest neighbor. You actually have those kind of patterns start well. So genetically, it's always like incom uh, uh, incompressible the state that you find. Um, so those are a very good question. So if it's, I mean, for the intermediate feeling, like if it's not say one and a half, so it's more like a really incommensurate. Um, it's it's hard to, I mean, in transport maybe there will be some compress compressible state, but uh, it's very hard for STM to tell. Like uh, we, uh, yeah, with STM you only look at the kind of a localized uh, configuration and uh, very often we, we still see like a uh, fairly well defined like uh, one or two occupation at the different positions. Yes, you see some form of phase separation. Uh, so uh, when in the region that is relatively homogeneous, we don't really see phase separation, but we more <laughs> see like a, uh, j just again, if you think about the way it want to look, I mean, minimize the potential energy, like uh, the, the two electron occupied, which has larger charge, they will actually be want to be further apart from each other. So you don't actually see phase separation. Instead, you will see this uh, uh, one electron, two electron uh, distribution will be more uh, kind of uh, spread out between them. Makes the question about the shape of the potential. How does it change between the electron side and the whole side? Uh, so, so they, I think they actually localize a different part of the Mori unit cell. And uh, so for electron side, it's definitely less deep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and the shape, like, is it like a triangle lattice or is it a honeycomb lattice? The, the, the bottom? Oh, uh, they, they are all kind of, they, they are all triangle lattices for this two, uh, 60 degree two state samples. On um, both the electron and the whole set? Yeah, for both electron side and the okay. whole side. Like, uh, so that's the thing. So if you are close to zero twist angle, you tend to have, for, for homo bilayer, you tend to have hexagonal lattices. But for close to 60 degree angle, you usually get triangle lattices. Yes. There are regimes where the molecular orientation can show a correlation, or is it always the potential? Like this three electron case, there might be they might be somewhat turned. Is that just? Yeah. So, or maybe I will show you <laughs> in the next. Yeah, so I think that's largely determined by the kind of accidental strain in the situation. Okay, so here I just show you like, uh, oh, when you change the uh, Mori period a little bit, then the, so, so when the Mori period is a little bit large, you can see the pretty well-defined three dot. And when the Mori period is smaller, then it's kind of harder to distinguish, so maybe, when you change the Mori period, this competition between potential and kinetic energy is a little bit different. And furthermore, or in a lot of systems, there are random strains. Like, uh, so, and when you have strain, the kind of configuration can change very dramatically. And uh, yeah, the, the thing that you see a little bit uh, anisotropic, I think is largely due to there's some residue strain and then the strain basically will distort the, the kind of nearby region or in similar ways. So yeah, I guess th it will be a very interesting question to ask, like if you have really kind of a, or no strain, whether there will be some <laughs> spontaneously like a pneumatic type of uh, order come up. So I, I think we haven't been able to distinguish that yet. Because the intermolecular interaction should still be pretty strong, right? The scale yeah, that's right, I indeed, yes. So this was exactly also my question. So the, as, as far as I understood, the, the Wigner crystallization is something coming from the long-range Coulomb interaction, right? <clears throat> if I understand your model or your understanding of the system here so far correctly, you basically trap electrons in, in deep potentials due to the Mori potential, right? Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So oh, first, uh, uh, I mean, maybe the, the, the terminology of Wigner molecule is what people have used when they uh, study actually the quantum dot. So inside of a quantum dot, in a single quantum dot, when you have multiple electrons, they form this, uh, I mean, so it's still 
or I mean, the long range is <laughs> relative. So this is basically still the, the way in a single quantum dot, they form these uh, uh, separated electrons dominated by Coulomb interaction was historically called Wigner molecules. And then basically we just have, so in this case, we just think this is a periodical array of this quantum dot. Uh, th so, so, so the energy is dominated by individual quantum dot, but indeed there should be some coupling between adjacent quantum dot and hopping, and those will be things that will be interesting to learn in the future. Okay, any other question? Okay, so oh, now let's go uh, beyond the quantum dot, uh, which is largely a kind of a two, one, zero D case where you have multiple electrons. Let's go to one D case when you add many electrons. Uh, <clears throat> So if you have uh, two, uh, 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 2D material together and uh, imagine they are perfectly aligned, but you just stretch one relative to the other a little bit, then basically all from one side the atom may be kind of uh, aligned. And then after some distance, it will be shifted by one atom. And because the material would prefer the AB or BA type of stacking, then they will reconstruct and push all the strain inside that narrow, relatively narrow region, basically form a domain wall. So when they concentrate this strain, basically the, the lattice uh, registration shifts off one atom, uh, basically in this relatively narrow region. And then they basically can form these uh, layer stacking uh, domain walls. Uh, so, or you can imagine if you have a very little strain, they were concentrated in one or a very few domain walls. But when the strain is relatively large, it will actually be able to realize kind of a periodical array of these uh, domain walls. So basically each domain wall will give you one lattice shift. And if you have many lattice shifts, they basically will uh, form this periodical array of domain walls. So these one dimension domain wall, they actually provide a very nice system to explore kind of Lattinger liquid or 1D uh, 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 physics because they are <clears throat> compared with uh, what people have done in other 1D systems, they actually have several unique advantages like uh, or compared with what people can do with quantum wires. Uh, this domain wall is actually very strong confinement. The lateral dimension is only uh, about one nanometer. So it's really in the 1D limit. And compared with carbon nanotube, uh, this also has advantage in the sense they can actually be ma made much cleaner. So if you have, or well, ideal nanotube is very clean, but once you start to make a uh, like device out of it or like uh, fabrication, uh, they tend to be a lot of a uh, uh, sorbate and basically kind of a, uh, those disorder dominate almost everything that you want to measure. But in this case, uh, or make use of all these things we have learned about the exfoliation and the stacking, we can actually keep the system uh, rather clean. And also uh, because they, this 1D domain wall are embedded in a 2D system. So when you make electrical contact and make uh, electrical devices, it's much more straightforward forward and uh, basically allow us to control the doping and, uh, and uh, do all kinds of measurement much more uh, uh, conveniently. Okay, so this is a case when we start to dope electrons in our individual uh, domain wall. So, uh, so in this case, uh, again, in most materials, there are naturally defects. And in this case, the defect, there are two defects uh, over here. So they basically form pinning center, those charge doesn't move. And when you add the electron in the system, you can see basically when you increase the electron density, they just form this kind of uh, electron necklace. Uh, so this basically you know, can be considered as a 1D Wigner crystal. We know in strict 1D, there's no long range order, but in a finite chain, uh, they look as good as a crystal that you can think of. Uh, and then when you start to increase the electron density, then this Wigner crystal basically will start to deform and uh, uh, they start to kind of melt. So here is the intermediate uh, uh, electron density level. So at the uh, lower density side, you still see the very nice periodical density of electron. At the higher density is actually, the, the oscillation becomes harder to see, but in order to increase the signal to noise ratio, what we can do is just integrate along this vertical direction. And then also just uh, 
change the kind of a, a, <clears throat> a zoom in in the uh, uh, amplitude change, then what we can see is like across this density change, there are still kind of oscillation that's present. And furthermore, we, we actually see something interesting, like at the uh, bottom part, you see this almost periodic uh, Wigner uh, crystal uh, uh, period. And when you increase the electron density, there's actually a dimerization behavior. So what you can see is uh, these two lines, when they go up, they actually get closer to each other. Uh, so, <clears throat> and this is uh, kind of uh, confirmed by BMRG uh, simulations. So you can actually see that indeed, when you increase the electron density, there will be a kind of electron dimerization. Uh, there are different ways to understand this dimerization behavior. Like some theories say, oh, these are all in, I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, described by just interacting Lardinger liquid when you vary the density. Um, but for physics, I mean, experimentalists, I would like to see whether there are some more intuitive physical picture that can uh, uh, kind of describe this phenomena. And there was a theoretical uh, paper uh, uh, early on, I actually talk about uh, when the uh, 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 how this dimerization uh, can, can appear. So what they uh, argue is that in the Wigner crystal uh, region, uh, basically the electron actually has anti-ferromagnetic coupling. So when the density becomes a little bit higher, the anti-ferromagnetic coupling actually or increase uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, exponentially, so it increases. So when this anti-ferromagnetic coupling becomes large enough, then what you can see is that there's a competition between the Coulomb potential where they just want the electron to form a perfect lattice and this anti-ferromagnetic coupling, they want to form kind of a, a singlet pairs. So the competition of this elastic energy and the magnetic energy basically can drive a dimerization behavior. Uh, <clears throat> And this uh, can be kind of uh, uh, confirmed by uh, uh, the DMRG calculation. So if we look at the, this dimerized uh, uh, part and we calculate the spin correlation between the adjacent electrons, we see that uh, indeed in the kind of a dimerized part, the, the kind of a, uh, spin singlet <coughs> uh, uh, anti-ferromagnetic magnet coupling uh, of the spin is, is enhanced. Uh, so in that sense, this is actually analogous to the dimerization in the polyacetylene. Like uh, it basically uh, want to basically uh, dimerize to lower kind of a, some kind of uh, the, the uh, <coughs> basically spin singly the energy. So, and then if we go to even uh, higher density, uh, then basically the oscillation, I, I mean, the dimerization thing basically it's not obvious anymore. So we really just see uh, like a uh, 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 reduced uh, oscillation period at, uh, at one half of the, uh, 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 this case. Uh, I mean, uh, a period that is like uh, uh, doubled or K, uh, I mean, the, moment, uh, the, the K is uh, uh, one half. So if we do basically a Fourier transform, what we can see is uh, at the low density, the Wigner crystal, when you have like spin half system, it has an oscillation period of 4kF. And then when the like, uh, or the density is uh, very high, so it's basically a, like weakly interacting Lattinger liquid, you have only the uh, 2kF uh, oscillation. And in the, in the intermediate region where you see strong 2kF and 4kF uh, component is where the dimerization behavior is the strongest. Is it feasible to do these experiments in magnetic field? Because according to this story, the dimerization is associated with singlet. So if I just polarize everybody, it should go away. It is feasible, and Professor Chrome is trying to do it. Like uh, so, uh, it does need a pretty strong magnetic field. So, so the STM that we did this work does not have magnetic field, uh, but uh, there is a. Uh, system that uh, in Mike's group that they have a magnetic field. So, and that's what we are indeed trying, right? Help you enough, all right, interesting. <laughs> okay. And also a quick question about the experimental realization. Do, are you, um, do you need to be lucky to find defects or can you put defects where you want and engineer these, these pinning on your own? Um, 
so right now it is uh, i mean these defects are naturally present we just uh, use it but uh, yeah but but create a df defect is actually quite possible with stm we can just uh, zap it with a high current then we can indeed uh, it's hard to make def defect go away but uh, to create a new defect is quite doable <clears throat> okay then we can uh, study what happens when you have this arrays of uh, like 1d channels um, so uh, so basically uh, well, we, we can first look at a very low dense density limit where you can see here individual uh, 1d domain work be form basically a weak crystal state. But then when you look at the, the uh, adjacent ones, you, you see this electron really form this zigzag pattern. And when you do a 2D Fourier transform, you can see actually very nice uh, diffraction pattern. So this basically <laughs> says that uh, all in the low density limit, the coupling between the chains are strong enough. They basically form, um, uh, and then again, to minimize the uh, Coulomb energy, they basically, the electrons want to be far apart from each other. That's why they form these like uh, zigzag uh, chains. And they basically stabilize uh, like a two dimensional uh, electron crystal. Uh, however, in this case, when we change the electron density, the, the chain chain interaction strength actually can be modulated. Uh, the way to understand is, uh, is actually fairly straightforward. If you have a periodical charge in one chain, and you ask in the adjacent chain, what's the kind of, a, of residue periodical potential? So when you increase the electron density or the DC energy suddenly, uh, the, the net Coulomb potential suddenly increase. But if you look at the, the periodical oscillation part, you'll find that uh, the periodical oscillation part actually will decrease uh, exponentially when the chain separation is larger than these two particle separation. So this is just simple electrostatics. Uh, so what you can see is uh, when the kind of a chain chain separation becomes larger than electron electron separation, the kind of the, the coupling constant decrease very strongly. Uh, and then uh, we can easily change the electron density. And uh, when the density becomes high, the electron distance becomes small. Then it turns out that the periodical coupling between the chain becomes weaker. So in this case, what we found is like when we go to or higher and or even higher densities, uh, what, what we can see is that inside individual chain, you still have uh, regular crystallization. So you have order along that direction. But uh, uh, between different chains, then they don't have any phase coherence anymore. So it's kind of a random phase. So uh, what happens basically, and if you do a diffraction pattern again, so you can see in this case, they are well kind of crystallized. But in this case, uh, you, you can see along this, uh, this direction. So you have a well-defined point here, but along this direction, they are very much spread out. So that means there is really no kind of a, a correlation, a phase correlation between the different chains. Uh, so, uh, and that's just because, so this actually the random uh, phase uh, uh, the difference between different chain here is actually driven by disorders because you, each line has slightly different random disorder. So when the chain chain interaction is very strong, the electron lattice will actually stretch uh, to make them to basically uh, have exactly the same period uh, and form an ordered behavior. But when the chain chain interaction is very weak, they just don't care. Uh, so they basically each have a random phase. So in this case, uh, you have order along one direction and disorder along the other direction. So it kind of uh, is analogous to this uh, uh, smective liquid crystal phase. They have basically order along one direction, but uh, disorder along the other direction. So you can think of this as a example of a smectic, like a electron uh, liquid crystal, uh, basically at this situation. Okay, so uh, last we'll go back to the, uh, oh, supposedly the simplest case where you don't have any periodical uh, uh, potential in the system. So basically, so if we have only a simple 2D system, uh, when we dope the electron, what the original Wigner crystal uh, will look like. So uh, in order to kind of uh, study the Wigner crystal phase, we think, I mean, uh, we are motivated to look at uh, 
uh, system with large effective mass of the uh, uh, charge carriers because the simple analysis tells us if you have large effective mass, basically you have like a large RS and then you, the, the, the Wigner crystal uh, phase can be more robust. Uh, and with a uh, transition metal dichrocogenite, we actually have different choices. We can have different monolayer uh, transition metal dichrocogenite. We can also have different, say, bilayer, trilayers, and so on and so forth. Uh, and here, I uh, actually show a, a kind of a, a initial calculation of MOSE2 for monolayer, bilayer, and the trilayer, and look at uh, the effective mass for holes. So what we found, if you have a monolayer uh, 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 MOSE2, the uh, K value electron has a, a, a mass of about 0.5, but then the gamma value actually has very large effective mass uh, for holes. Uh, but the, however, for monolayer, the gamma value is very deep. So like uh, when you dope holes, it's not accessible. So it's not very useful. But, however, if you look at the, the bilayer uh, uh, MOIC2, uh, due to the layer hybridization, it turns out the gamma point actually becomes the lowest energy state. So when you dope holes, you can now access the gamma point. And then the uh, theory calculation shows the effective mass of the gamma point uh, holes still is quite large, more than one. So uh, as a result, it motivated us to actually study not monolayer MOSE2, but bilayer MOSE2. And for whole dope inside, we can uh, use this large effective mass so that then the kind of uh, or electron solid can exist in a higher like uh, density range. Uh, so this basically is the experimental data for a uh, uh, whole doped uh, 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 MOSE2 sample. So the left-hand side image shows uh, just the topography image. Uh, you, uh, so now we found that this sample actually uh, is not the best sample, like the disorder uh, is uh, relatively high. Like, uh, so you can see these bright points. So those are kind of charged disorders that are particularly uh, strong in the topography image. But if you, huh? You know what they are. I mean, are they vacancies? Are they oxygen instead of sulfur? Are they something instead of uh, tungsten? Actually, for the charge, the uh, uh, defect, I think there's still no consensus what, what they are. Uh, so uh, we also see there are actually even more weaker disorders that, uh, so like this point, if you kind of, uh, so some of those are oxygen rep replacing uh, sulfur. So basically this substitution is a, uh, 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 isovalent defect, so they, they are not charge defect. And, the, uh, and some people claim even for the vacancy, they actually behave more like a, a, a isovalent defect. So I think people are still trying to figure out exactly what defects are there. But, some, but, but the oxygen replacing sulfur or selenide seems to be a common uh, thing that, that are present. Okay, uh, and then uh, if we start to kind of a dope hole in the system, uh, so what we can see is uh, all this uh, charge density are rather localized. They are very spotty. So that uh, kind of uh, led us to think these are more like a solid behavior. The electrons are really rather well localized at specific point rather than like an electron liquid where they are more spread out and uh, homogeneous. And if we kind of look at the individual region, oh, some of them can be semi like a, 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 a triangle lattice, but the, what you can clearly see is like uh, all the, the, the orientation of these are kind of random. So this doesn't have long range order at all. So they are kind of a disordered electron solid. Uh, so if we kind of are all trying to determine the position of individual dot uh, using some kind of a, a mathematical treatment, we can then identify oh, what are the individual particle and how many nearest neighbor they, they, they have. So in an ideal uh, situation, basically every uh, single atom should have six nearest neighbors uh, in a, uh, but uh, with this disorder, what we found is uh, about 60% of the uh, uh, holes have six nearest neighbors. And then there are about 40 of them has five or seven uh, uh, membered like uh, uh, nearest neighbors. So that means indeed the disorder is rather strong. This uh, pentagon and the heptagon cells are very 
uh, common. <laughs> Uh, and then what we can do is basically change the electron density and study how uh, basically the, the solid behavior uh, 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 change uh, and also at the end at very high density, how do they melt? So, okay, maybe just uh, one comment. Uh, uh, so this actually uh, is already at five times 10 to the 12 centimeter square. So this is already a very rather high density. If you think about uh, Gallium arsenide, usually the Wigner crystal is present at an electron density like 10 to the negative 10 or even less. So this is actually several times 10 to the 12. So it's really benefit from the very strong Coulomb interactions because the dielectric constant is smaller and also the effective mass uh, uh, is, is very large. Uh, okay. So, so we can study actually uh, how the electron density change both in the solid phase as well as the solid liquid kind of a transition. So firstly, if we just uh, zoom in in a small region and see like e the, the whole thing is like solid, but when we just increase the electron density, how does the solid e uh, evolve? So in the ideal Wigner crystal, uh, the picture is actually pretty straightforward. When you increase the density, everything will just shrink homogeneously. Uh, but the, now with the disorder, the situation is rather different and maybe a little bit uh, also interesting. Uh, so because there are some points that are uh, fixed, so you cannot have, have a homogeneous uh, kind of a change. So what uh, really happens is you kind of need to squeeze the electrons to form like a interstitial or like a defects in, in the local solid. So one thing, for example, initially you can see there are like four electrons in this uh, uh, dashed box. When you start to increase the electron density, uh, what you can see is actually they are start to have some uh, kind of uh, fuzziness around these electrons. And when the electron density is further increased, it basically form this five electron uh, over here. And similarly, if you want to further increase the electron density, uh, then basically it becomes fuzzier and then it becomes a more well-defined six uh, uh, particle state here. So it's like a, uh, you are adding quantum defect into this local region. That's how this like uh, density uh, uh, increase in this uh, uh, solid region. Uh, and then next we can just all go to even higher density and see how things uh, melt. Like, uh, so in this case, all oh, things are mostly bodies like a solid. And when we increase the uh, uh, electron density, what we found is in some region, the, the, it becomes more or less homogeneous. So, I mean, it's hard to have a perfect probe for solid and the liquid. So the kind of, for experimental uh, purpose, we just say, or look at the local contrast. If the kind of percentage contrast change is very small, we say that's almost like a liquid phase. And if the contrast is very strong, then we say it's like a solid phase. So you use that kind of a semi kind of, kind of a practical criteria. We can see that when we increase the density, first there are kind of small bubble region where the, uh, the, the kind of liquid phase emerge. And when you increase the density, they kind of expand. And when you increase the density more, they kind of start to form a percolation pathway. So, so it's like uh, maybe the solid to liquid change, at least with this disordered system, is like a percolation, like formation uh, process. Uh, uh, but then there is a, certainly a pretty large density range. You basically have mixture of liquid and solid uh, behavior. Uh, Okay, uh, this kind of uh, electron liquid solid mixture phase uh, or can potentially have many different uh, uh, physical origins. Uh, to commonly uh, uh, describe the picture is uh, uh, a scenario like this. Uh, one scenario is like once you have disorder, maybe a natural thing to have is uh, uh, if you have long range potential fluctuation, then when you increase the electron density, some density, some region will have higher density, some region will have lower density. Then naturally lower density part will be more like solid and higher density part will be more like liquid. And this long range potential disorder can naturally lead to a liquid solid uh, mixture. Uh, there's also some theoretical proposal uh, arguing that the electron solid 
uh, region will happen uh, even spontaneously in an ideal uh, 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 um, uh, electron solid without disorder. Uh, but then with disorder, maybe then this electron uh, solid phase can be further localized and uh, kind of, uh, or maybe even uh, stabilized a little bit. Uh, so well, what we can do is we can actually at least test the scenario one to see whether this uh, higher density, uh, I mean, the, the liquid and solid phase is correlated with long range potential fluctuation. Uh, so the, uh, the argument is like this, like if you have a long range potential fluctuation coming from the disorder, so that will be basically a fixed pattern. So that will be present both for low electron density and high electron density. Uh, so if at the low electron density uh, uh, limit, we actually have the electron solid, we can really count the local electrons uh, and then know what's the local electron density. And we can uh, have this electron density uh, map. So locally, uh, <coughs> we, we see large fluctuations, but we don't see long range, basically, variation of uh, uh, electron density average. And in particular, if we look at the, this later, the region that later become liquid versus the region that actually uh, will remain as solid, and the compare with the average uh, the electron density, we found that there's no correlation at all. So that means it's really not driven by a long range of uh, uh, potential fluctuation. It's more like uh, but we do see the solid region is uh, kind of correlated with higher uh, uh, defect densities. So I think what happens is defects still play a very important role. They are definitely pinning the solid. They might also kind of make the solid more stable uh, across a larger electron density. But uh, yeah, further understanding, I guess, requires more theoretical work. Okay, with that, I would like to conclude. So with this uh, 2D system, uh, when you have, oh, 2D potential, 1D potential, or even without potential, uh, the electron solid behavior can actually uh, manifest in very different ways. And there will be or many more uh, uh, studies uh, maybe needed to fully understand their behavior. And I would like to oh, thank uh, people who, uh, so this is a very strong collaboration with uh, Mike Cromie's group uh, at Berkeley. Uh, so the experimental uh, work is really spearheaded by a talented graduate student Hong Yuan Li and with help from Zhu Yu and Jiang Han. And uh, the theory work uh, of initial calculation by meeting uh, Louis group and uh, the 1D uh, case uh, coming from Tian Le in uh, Zelotel group and then Wigan Molecule coming from uh, Liang Fu's group. And we also have discussion with Steve Kivelson and the sample coming from the Arizona state and BN coming from Japan. And thank you for your attention. For uh, the second part, uh, the last part of your talk, um, you said, okay, the bilayer has the, the wonderful optimal, let's say, effective mass in the gamma valley. But there you also have the, this bonding antibonding formation you said before. So there the hybridization between the layers is also the strongest, right? In the gamma valley. Meaning I think you're doping into something like an antibonding um, state between the two layers, um, which might be the reason why this might be more strongly affected by, by the uh, impurities in the, both in both layers might act on, on the same state. Anyway, what I wanted to ask is, did you try the same also for the for the mono layer? Even though in the K valley, the effective mass is not optimal, but there you might get more clean scenarios. I wonder if you might get more clean scenarios. Yeah, um, so we are trying more samples in different uh, or mono layers, bi layers, and improve the defect densities. Uh, one problem with STM is a very, slow measurement compared with uh, many transport or even optical thing like for each sample try require many months so so we haven't systematically compared the di different system yet yeah but but we are actually uh, so mostly still focusing on bilayer but looking at more like a uh, sources coming from different places to see whether we can get the higher quality sample with lower defects. Like, uh...
Uh, so a quick question about the metallic gate that you have to control the doping. How far is it from the sample? Are you worried about the screening effect of that gate? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, so right now, these samples, the gate are still like uh, maybe 20 nanometer away. Uh, given the electron density over here, uh, I mean, the electron-electron separation are all 10 nanometer or smaller. So we think the gate effect is relatively small. It's not very strong. Oh, negligible, that's cool. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, in the future, or once we have a good handle on this, it will be uh, good to have even thinner BN so you have stronger screening effect and see basically to, to really quantitative study what their effect are. So I, I think right now they are um, yeah, relatively weak, but maybe you can say they are still present. Chris, if you had a comparison with the classical uh, transition and if you have like actual signatures of some quantum fluctuations in this known in some, some way. Um, uh, that's a very good question. So maybe we can have more discussion. I actually don't know what will be the signature. I guess, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, in the solid case, when we add the electrons, the way that it behavior seems to be at least kind of quantum, like in the sense you have delocalized electrons. Uh, in this transition, I, I don't know what are the signature to look at. So I think it's usually beyond percolation. I think quantum tunneling will dress it beyond percolation. It's usually the picture. Oh, uh, okay. Um, yeah, so... Signatures of that, maybe, in, in, I don't know. Probably very hard to go patch to patch because that's a big stand. But, uh, that's right. So I, I guess... It should be very interesting to think about. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, maybe we can discuss more to, to see like, a, yeah, what kind, yeah, I think it requires basically targeted measurement with very fine kind of a... So, uh, two questions about this. Do you have an experimental way of assessing the density in the ordered and disordered patches? I mean, I can sort of under, imagine you can count the localized electrons. Oh, but in the in the patches which you identify as metallic and liquid, is there an experimental way to know what the local density is? Uh, it's harder. Um, um, th that's a very good question. Like, uh, um, so I mean, although these are rather smooth, if we do Fourier transform, they are still like a vague uh, kind of a pattern that we can see. Maybe we can try to correlate that with, I mean, say Fermi energy or something to, to compare it with electron density. But the, I don't know how quantity, I mean, it's pretty fuzzy. So I, I don't know how quantitative we can get uh, in that case. Uh, beyond that, uh, I guess the question I is can I interpret the SDM spectra as a density of states and just integrate them over some range and compare the integral? Okay, I can think about, it. yeah, so that basically you need to assume the tunneling probability, like sure. is a constant or something. Yeah, like that. There, there's all of these, yeah, but, but if the energy scales aren't that big, you don't usually tunnel in probability, but, but anyway. Okay, um, the, the reason why I ask is that there's two reasons to have this metallic fluid. One is the Kibbelson region, reason, which is more or less managing charge density. And the other is just, you have two phases. There's a first order transition between them. One has been by disorder, one isn't. So even at the same density, you can have locally stable, both metallic and Wigner crystal ordered phases. So that's why it's interesting to know how big the densities are, to know whether the mechanism for this okay. is a density and homogeneity or something else. Uh, my, my second question, which pertains both to this and to your um, uh, array of one dimensional guys, was, did you do Voronoi constructions and things like that, right? There's ways to assess how much uh, actual long range order you have by, you know, how many defects there are in the Wigner crystal by doing things like drawing loops and counting angles and so on. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we actually did. Like uh, for the, I mean, when the array, they actually shows very pretty nice behavior. Like, I mean, the, the, the range is, I mean, the scanning range is not very large, but at least uh, uh, in the, I mean, in the range that you have, I mean, the, given the diffraction pattern is very sharp, that, that's- You know, the diffraction pattern is fine, but identify, there, there are standard constructions 
right, that allow you to identify defects and density of defects and correlation lengths and things like that. Okay, yeah, I guess maybe just the scanning range, I mean, the, the sample range is not large enough to get a long range one, but, right. uh, but for the 2D case, yeah, we don't see, I mean, we, we can see that it's rather disordered locally, right. so there is no long range order. So we so I guess the question was: it interesting to look for the densities of defects and uh, you know density of dislocations and dislocations? But all right, we can discuss yeah. that offline. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to to know what to do next will be very helpful. 